I used to think that inclusive housing was, I probably thought it was for, for people who were like unhoused, to be honest. With the purpose of maybe, I'll call it keeping people alive more than ensuring the quality of life. Definitely a mixed building. Honestly, I haven't thought about it that much and I hadn't thought about the importance of it. Including everyone in the building, including the, the members of the residents and the staff about each other and you can be independent with your own life. Welcome. This is day one, Housing Solutions Lab. How do you truly build a community that is intersectional, that is diverse, that has an equitable and has all of these elements that play. One of the things that interested me the most in joining the housing lab was no longer trying to adapt the person to the housing that's available, but rather let's look at adapting the housing to the people that are going to use it. We know that there is a history of exclusion and marginalization of people with developmental disabilities in Alberta. The long history of institutionalization and eugenics. And so as a part of the human-centered design process, we provided and created opportunities for lab participants to be anchored and aware of that kind of deep and important context. Human-centered design kind of counters conventional approach to problem solving, which would involve these kind of policy makers and decision makers up above creating solutions and imposing them on the people who actually live out the challenges. I thought it would be a window of opportunity to see what it's about there and to, and to see like how I can be of help there, like explain to my team there like some situations I've been through myself there. Once I went out and saw actually some of the accessible housing for people with wheelchair, they just didn't meet code. Yes, the countertops were fine, but you couldn't get into the bedroom because the door wasn't wide enough. It was like they were just makeshift and they didn't really meet the needs. You can have a nice place but still not belong. You can be have a nice place but not have inclusion in those connections. One of the key pieces is not just helping people be in community but of community. What would be natural and authentic to help there be community animation, bridge builders, community connectors that helps people identify their strengths and gifts and contribute those, not just people with disabilities, but people with and without. So this is literally the opposite. You start with the people who would be in the building, who would service the building, who would build it, right? So you start with them creating what it is. The Scattered Site team, for example, was designing for people who be labeled as having complex service needs within the PDD system. And so those are folks who often would be accessing kind of multiple services at multiple times. So they might be frequent users of the emergency room, in and out of homelessness, those kinds of things. The Shared Community team was looking at folks with developmental disabilities and thinking about kind of an alternative to your usual group home model, where we have three people living together um, as roommates in a home. Is there a way that we can kind of of reimagine that to have it better support kind of social inclusion for people. One of the main focuses that we had uh, on the Scattered Site team was to really focus in on community engagement and how having uh, a housing model that offers more opportunities for community engagement would help to avoid so much stigma and judgment. How do you make this for people living with, with disabilities, but at the same time how do you make this for everybody else? It's hard to, to figure out what the shape of that is and what the design of that community is. Because in a lot of ways, we were designing a way of living. The prototype that we came up with is called the Community Connections, a multi-unit, multi-family building with amenities on the main floor. We also have a community concierge that helps build uh, community connections and relationships. I'm on the shared communities team. Our prototype is really like co-housing, like how can we have multi-generational housing as well as like lots of shared spaces and stuff. We looked at having community kitchens or a shared meeting room so people could have events or board games or things like that. Community gardens on site. That's stuff that I hadn't even thought of and the option that it allowed people 
to make those connections e more easily, right? You're sharing a garden plot or things like that. You're talking to that person. You can make those natural friendships a lot easier. Once we had the idea for the prototype uh, flushed out and with the video and uh, the graphics, we went out and did a lot of stakeholder interview. Understand from people what's good about it, what do they like, what are some issues that they foresee, and what are some considerations we need to bring back to the table to redesign and what that might look like. We were surprised to hear that the and these were not-for-profit developers, that they believed that the concierge was a really clever term. I thought it was a bit cheesy to call it a concierge at first, but um, they said that would make it feel like it's more for the entire building instead of just being part of like the people in the building who are on needing extra support. And I never thought about it that way. So sometimes it's good to work, build off of something that already exists. When affordable housing is all kind of inner city based, I don't think I'd ever really thought about the fact that the majority of the people accessing that affordable housing and the services provided therein don't actually want to be in that area. Learning that helped us to not stay so focused on um, inner city land and inner city development. And there are other areas in the city where a housing project like that could come to fruition where it would be deemed um, accessible as far as transit and shopping. Another interview was with Levi, someone who has developmental disabilities, but also is in a wheelchair. He's uh, gone to Nate for architecture. So what an incredible thing to meet someone who knows exactly what we're doing and knows exactly how important it is. And just to see his uh, his desire to be involved, to be a part of it, and and his ideas on 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 community housing and and even his reflection on where he lives and how he lives and the difficulties. That interview, you know, it's you gain empathy. It's difficult, you know. He was stuck in a hospital for months because he had no place to live. You know, it's <laughs> it's difficult. You know, and, and that moves you to want to do more. This is something that's been a trouble for me for the last for five to ten years, I would say. They yeah, trying to find a good place. So my mom and my family doesn't have to worry about me. I've been really thankful to get to know him in Wayne and I'll probably be working with him more often now. I feel like there's more action in this project than I've ever seen in any, any other projects that I've heard about. I don't think they did as much research and communication, diversity of different groups. When we were done, I think everyone said they would live there. Like. That, and that, that's exactly what we want to achieve. We want to achieve something for everybody that is not just tailored to one group of people. Right now, there's not a lot of examples of what real inclusive housing looks like. And so hopefully out of this project, it will be something that someone can say, yeah, this is what we mean when we say inclusive housing. These are the different features and elements that make it inclusive. And this is something that really works within um, the systems as they exist. These labs are really important because it's always incredible what you can come up with when all different people from different backgrounds come together and talk about the same topic from different perspectives. It's ideas that you could never individually come up with. You have to have all those perspectives to find that, like a holistic solution. It's not just like an individual's experience, but also uh, indirectly their families, their loved ones, um, and how that comes into play and what does that look like and what does that mean. Who is being left behind? Who isn't being thought of when we're designing our cities, our buildings, our really everything? Who needs a development like the one that we've come up with, that we've designed? And it it is people living with disability, but there's there's also there's a lot of people who need a, a place to call home. It's a different way of thinking. It's about a supportive community. 
And it doesn't matter whether you have disabilities or whether you're a senior or whether you're a family or anyone. We all look for supportive communities and especially with COVID and the isolation, I, there's no better time than to come up with a prototype like this.